Everybody knew that this was unprecedented. No developed Western country had defaulted in any way on government debts. Basically, in the whole post-World War II era, this was an entirely new situation. In the pantheon of financial crises, this is mammoth. It's bigger than Russia in 1998. It's bigger than the Asian financial crisis. It has been a slow-moving train wreck. There was this sense in Europe that, oh no, the euro can't fall apart. Surely everyone will understand that if the euro dies, there will be a huge economic cost. Surely nobody wants to go back to the lira, the franc, the drachma. Hank Paulson, the former Treasury Secretary of the US, said that when there is a crisis, you have to take out the bazooka. That means act quickly, act decisively, and put a lot of money into the system. The Europeans did none of that. Europe is at the brink. Its economy faces a long recession, its people are restive, and the order that has brought peace to a once war-torn continent may yet come apart. In just two years, a government debt crisis that began here in Greece has infected all of Europe, and maybe soon, the world. Now the nations of the Eurozone face a stark choice. Repair the currency block at great cost, or dissolve the Euro and take a trip into the frightening unknown. United Europe was at its birth and remains at its heart an economic idea. Peace was its purpose, but economics the means. How do we avoid another World War I? How do we avoid another World War II? We bind nations together economically. We bind them together financially so that it is no longer in their self-interest to go to war. In March 1957, the Treaty of Rome was signed. In 1957, you had the European Economic Community, free movement of labor and goods. 1979 was the first experiment with a currency union by linking currents, European currencies, which then led to the European monetary system, which was the precursor to what we know and love today, the euro. And I think as, as important as individual European states, such as Germany and France, are as economic powers, the binding together of these could let them continue to be collectively true players on the world stage. By centuries end, the 15 members of the European Union had agreed on a common currency that most would share. They had achieved the economic integration that they'd spent 50 years building, brick by brick. At midnight tonight, we, the 300 million people of the Euro area, will all cross a symbolic bridge. The introduction to the euro, if we think back to it uh, at the time, was remarkably smooth from a logistical point of view. We Europeans just started using it, forgot about our national currency, and that worked. Initially, the euro slipped against the dollar, but by the end of 2003, it was above the price at its birth. For a while, the euro did very well, uh, partly held by the uh, weakness in the dollar. And I think a lot of us thought at the outset of the euro that there would be a united Europe. Once we, the euro was established, it seems like the big steps to get to that those next levels of cohesion never actually happened. What do we have in Europe? We have this Tower of Babel, we have this cacophony of voices, we have frictions between Germany and France and Italy. The so-called original sin of European monetary union was that they created a system where you have monetary union without fiscal union. The structure of the euro was such that uh, you had to take fiscal discipline by the governments on faith because the European Union does not touch the fiscal sovereignty of government. So you would have a group of countries with widely diverging economic growth potential and frankly fiscal positions with one interest rate, one currency. The issue unfortunately was that uh, the uh, fiscal discipline wasn't there whereas the monetary discipline was. The thought was handing over monetary policy to the European Central Bank would go a long way in obviating the problems of the different fiscal regimes. It is a very, very tough monetary authority, which in the end put the screws on economic growth in Europe. That's where the seeds of the current problems were planted because countries like Greece and Italy were unable to grow as much as the others and, caused, and had therefore to resort to lax fiscal discipline in order to grow. Financial markets treated all Euro members pretty much the same, handing out loans to Greece on nearly the same terms as loans to Germany. Behind that grave error was a misplaced assumption that all the Euro countries were in it together, that none would let a fellow fail. That created a terrible problem, 
With borrowing costs low, there was no penalty for reckless spending. And uh, governments began to take on more and more debt. Greece took the most dangerous path. To make up for weak job creation in its private economy, it pumped up the public payroll. That meant more borrowing. How do you force a Greece or an Italy to behave in a way that they choose not to behave without causing some kind of schism within the Eurozone that would damage the collective? All of that kind of came to uh, a head in 2008. The whole thing began with lousy real estate loans in the United States. But of course it evolved from there. Individuals had overborrowed, which got the banks into trouble. The banks were bailed out by countries. So we have the financial crisis in the United States. We have the collapse of Lehman. And what does that do to the world? It causes all sorts of strictures in capital movement. One of the things we learned in the fall of 2008 is that financial viruses are extremely contagious. So when the first uh, germs of the crisis started spreading from the United States to the other countries in around 2008, I was talking to people back in Europe and they were quite optimistic. They felt that the car crisis was a crisis uh, predominantly made in the US, which would have had an impact on the rest of the world, but not really uh, undermine the foundations of their economic projects. And of course, they were um, spectacularly wrong. And there's nothing that happened in subprime mortgages in the United States that can explain why Greece was able to get into the Eurozone, essentially lying about its finances, and why that chicken finally came home to roost. In October 2009, a rude surprise from Greece. A budget deficit predicted to be around 3% of GDP was actually 12%. Foreign investors who have been buying Greece's debt panicked. By early 2010, they had started to charge more and more to lend to Greece. And so the first sort of shock, if you like, to the Euro system was the knowledge that Greece actually was borrowing far more than people had thought. I thought that the Europeans were smart enough to know that this was not something that should be allowed to fester. And I was a little surprised that they were unable to move more quickly to, as the saying goes, put a firewall around Greece. And that, frankly, goes to, uh, speaks to a structural flaw in the EU. It is very, very slow in making decisions because there's so many governments that have to have their say. And therefore, uh, the Greece problem, which could have been tackled easily and resolved, was never resolved. This first phase of the crisis was, will Greece be able to repay its debt? Will it need help? And that sort of led up to the first bailout of the crisis in, in Greece in May 2010. Greece got a bailout and Europe had built itself a rescue fund. But because of the way the Eurozone was designed, the contagion was hellishly difficult to control. Fresh concerns about Greece are weighing on markets worldwide this morning. Fresh As the investors rethink this and wonder, you know, this is a brewing crisis. How's this going to get fixed? Who's going to pick up the tab for, for, for Greece? Are they going to be able to pay back their debts? I've got all of their bonds. Should I be worried, actually, about holding the sovereign debt of Greece? Can I count on Germany? Can I count on the ECB to come to their rescue and pay me off? I don't think so. Fearing inflation and restricted by its mandate, the European Central Bank stepped in only tepidly and reluctantly. Europe put Greece on an extreme diet of austerity and hoped for the best. Through the course of 2010, progressively, sort of more questions were being asked, and this was being reflected in the increases of borrowing costs for some other countries. There was a real worry that Spain would be following the Greeks, and uh, there were also worries uh, about Portugal. I guess the next phase of the crisis really intensified when it became apparent that Ireland's housing boom had turned to bust. People thought, well, Greece is the problem, and as long as we insulate it, we're fine. And it suddenly said, oh, well, actually, this, could, this can move to Ireland, this can move to Portugal, Spain, Italy, because suddenly any country with bad debt dynamics, we have to think that that's a possible loss. So we have to be very careful about buying those bonds. By the time Greece and then Spain and Portugal were also in trouble, there were questions starting uh, to arise about Italy. Uh, it is a much bigger country, has the third largest bond market in the world. The first time that the European debt crisis washed up on Italy's shores was in November 2010. That was the first time when we really saw the spreads between Italian bonds and their German equivalent soar. There were a lot of meetings in 2010, a lot of summits that were supposed to solve the issue. There were a lot of rescue plans announced, but unfortunately uh, none of it was acted or none of it was acted decisively so that the markets could uh, finally uh, 
put their fears to rest. There was a key moment in 2010 that if you talk to senior officials around Europe now, that they see as being one of the biggest mistakes in the handling uh, of this crisis. And that was the agreement made between the German Chancellor Angela Merkel and the French President Nicolas Sarkozy on the boardwalk of the French resort of Deauville uh, in October 2010. As they were discussing solutions to the European debt crisis, they raised for the first time the idea of what then became called private sector involvement. This is a sort of euphemism for bondholder losses. Markets had always believed in one fundamental point, that a European country would not let one of its partners default. What it did do was to make a whole new host of investors in government bond markets scared of investing. Once they let the genie out of the bottle, they couldn't stuff it back in, and the genie's out of the bottle now. Two thousand and eleven was the year when the euro really risked falling apart, and it was the year where European leaders seemingly didn't quite grasp that, and they missed opportunity after opportunity to turn things around. As the months progress, as the rescue packages failed, as the markets got more and more worried, and the bond deals soared uh, in the peripheral European countries, you could see that the markets got more and more worried. The banks were amongst the biggest holders of sovereign debt and the market started to become concerned about the banks. And What you saw was a below the surface, low key, low level bank run as one group of investors after another refused to stop funding the banks. I think the high point of Europe's effort to tackle this crisis was probably in March. There was an EU summit when the leaders decided a so-called comprehensive package and that consisted of beefing up the Eurozone's bailout fund. The Europeans have a, set up a rescue fund that probably wasn't big enough the day they set it up. They still haven't got it in place. Meanwhile, the problem's getting bigger and bigger. The, the problem that started in Greece quickly uh, spread. Uh, this is because of the market psychology. They immediately look for countries who have similar characteristics to the one in trouble because they want to protect themselves against future trouble. So in the case of the European Union, that meant that Spain and Portugal two peripheral countries with very similar characteristics to Greece in terms of lax fiscal discipline and welfare state and benefits were immediately targeted by investors. Again, it was a very, very familiar pattern. When I spoke to policymakers in March, April, for example, um, here in Berlin, there was a high degree of confidence that they were well on the way to containing this crisis. And I detected this confidence in, in Brussels, at the European Commission, uh, also in Frankfurt at the European Central Bank as well as in, in the German government. It proved false. By the end of April, three of the 17 Eurozone countries had been bailed out, but they were small and able to be contained by the bloc's rescue fund. If Europe could keep its mess to those three, it might be all right. But it didn't, and it wasn't. On June 15th, angry rioters filled central Athens. Police unloaded tear gas in a scene that would become almost commonplace. That evening, the government nearly fell trying to push through more EU-demanded austerity measures. Because Greece was having real trouble meeting the austerity measures that it agreed in, in May 2011, it became clear that Greece would need a second bailout. The bailout was crafted to be as inexpensive as possible and was plainly insufficient. The austerity diet was starving the economy, Greece's feeble political class failed to push through the toughest reforms. The Eurozone countries would put more money into Greece, but Greece's private creditors would have to take losses. A Pandora's box had been opened. The Eurozone would let one of its own default. So the Germans became convinced that Greek bondholders had to accept not just a delay in repayment, but a reduction in the amount that they would be repaid on Greek bonds. That kind of reduction is known in financial markets as a haircut. So the decision to force bondholders in Greece to take a, a loss was in some ways a sort of mini Lehman event for Europe. So what happened was it basically became clear that this sort of debt was no longer sacrosanct. 
um, that actually you might take losses on it. We were looking at uh, important indicators such as the VIX, which is a, it's often called the fear gauge. It's a sign of the volatility in the market. It spikes up when markets are particularly worried. And all of a sudden, as the year progressed, and particularly in the summer, uh, the VIX started spiking up. Bond investors went on a rampage. Their target massively indebted Italy, the Eurozone's third largest economy, second biggest debtor, and one of its worst economic performers. The threat to Europe's banking system became much more serious from the summer onwards when the crisis went beyond just Greece, Ireland and Portugal and began to infect Spain and Italy because those were two much bigger countries with huge government bond markets and many European banks uh, were heavily exposed to these two countries. Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi is under increasing pressure this morning as Italian... An Italian crisis was a thing apart. With two and a half trillion dollars in debt, it was too big to save. The European bailout fund was a fraction of that size. And asking other nations to make it bigger risked pulling them into the abyss too. I think the market's response after the European summit on July 21st was very telling. That was the clearest evidence that this thing was getting out of control. Because that emergency summit was supposed to wrap everything up. It, it agreed on a new Greek bailout. It agreed to do a little bit of Greek debt relief, but not very much. And Europe hoped that that would settle the market's nerves. Instead, there was complete pandemonium, and the pressure on Italian bonds in particular uh, became enormous. Right when the European crisis hit Italy, then people really panicked. Because it's one thing to bail out Greece, Portugal, Ireland. But if you have to bail out the Eurozone's third largest economy, it's unsustainable. The bond markets in Rome are burning and it is increasingly difficult to see the road out of the European debt crisis. So this, this was now a more dramatic threat than Europe had faced ever before. The prospect that Italy could either default or leave the euro really, really upset the markets uh, and then eventually caused a change of government in Italy. It's the spaghetti sell-off, the cannelloni crash or the bolognese bust, whatever you call it, stocks are sliding and it's all to do with Italy. Silvio Berlusconi is the biggest political victim of this European crisis. His government fell. Uh, largely prompted by the events of, of the debt crisis. Financial contagion today is real. You know, a big event in Europe can ricochet around the world. The latest of the 2011 make or break summits to save the euro was uh, in December. The December deal means that countries have to be more disciplined in their fiscal duties and that there will be some more sanctions if they're not. I believe this is a very, very important outcome after long negotiations because we are learning from the past and our mistakes. With this the summit, you know, it's clear that people aren't willing to go the ultimate step of saying we are going to all pool this debt together, which would be what would reassure the markets. It seems to me that the job of politicians at times like this is to make the essential politically possible. And instead, I'm afraid what we've seen in Europe is a little too much of blaming the political constraints for refusal to do what's necessary to save the European economy. It's possible that some good might come of this. European history shows that in the moment of crisis, two things can happen. One is the, the European countries lurch together, a more integrated fiscal union, and even the, uh, the, the, the first green shoots of a political union, or they fall further apart. The big question is, this debt crisis that's rolled around the world, is it something that can be stopped here, or is it something that is just going to continue for a long time? Because there are, of course, a few examples in history where things haven't bounced back. So what now? Proponents said Europe was getting there, that the erection of common laws, institutions, and policies would unite the region. Convergence was the buzzword. No need to wait for the ideal, build the euro, and everyone would come together. Does the euro make sense? Uh, there are 17 countries. The whole notion was built on the premise that, A, we needed to do this because it was important to integrate Europe politically, to avoid another war among European countries, to give Europe the size to compete with the United States. 
and on the hope that over time the economies would tend to converge. So that they would be more, more and more similar. That really hasn't happened. What a lot of investors see is the only way out of this crisis in the short term is for the ECB to step in with an unconditional guarantee, essentially, to buy as much uh, government bonds, as many government bonds as is necessary to stabilize the markets. The future of the, of the project will be decided, in my view, by Angela Merkel in Germany. She can either say, we must keep this together and we will put German taxpayer money in the German balance sheet at risk. The other one is to, to say we won't do that and if the markets decide that that's not good enough and the euro starts to fall apart, you unleash these economic forces that you can't really control. Some people are predicting ultimately a breakup of the Eurozone or at least one or two countries leaving it. So we actually don't know where this is going to go from here. It could go uh, in one of a number of directions. Uh, each one of those directions, I think, sort of portends low growth for Eurozone countries for the years to come. Uh, but one uh, possible breakup of the Eurozone is clearly uh, potentially much more threatening and uh, difficult than others, certainly in the short term, if that happens. This question of what might this do to the political makeup of Europe and uh, how might it push political opinion out to the edges, possibly to French candidates, is one that's very much on the minds of a Europe for which World War II happened yesterday, not you know decades ago. Um, it, 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 we, we can't underestimate how important the notion of economic stability and political stability is in a land that has gone through what Europe did. In the short term, the uh, debt crisis will lead to most likely a more disciplined approach to national finances. The deeper effect of the European debt crisis is that it will eventually lead to a profound revision of Europe's cherished welfare state. Will Europe be able to substitute its costly welfare system with an alternative that is more efficient, but at the same time fair, socially fair? Will Europe be able to have a more entrepreneurial spirit in the way that the US has, for example? Are Europeans really willing to accept those changes? Because if they're not, the European debt crisis will have taught us nothing. It is up to Europe, one way or the other, to save itself. If it can't, if one of the globe's richest regions is unable to hold back financial calamity, then surely the rest of the world will suffer the consequences as well.